Frozen takes place in a um, town called Arendelle, and um, there are these two sisters, Elsa and Anna, um, who grow up together um, with a very strong bond, and something happens along the way um, that kind of makes life a little bit difficult for them. And um, one of them, uh, Elsa, happens to have uh, a magical power where everything she touches essentially turns into ice and snow. And so um, when that happens, as you can imagine, it causes a couple of problems, a couple of family issues. Um, and her powers get the better of her, and Arendelle falls into a snowy, frozen, frozen tundra. Um, and uh, it, it's up, left up to um, Anna and her companions, including a talking snowman named Olaf, played by me, to help save the day um, before... Uh, Arendelle is forever trapped in this frozen kingdom. Great. Um, so how is Olaf created? Olaf is created through CGI. Uh, there's computers that are used. <laughs> um, I'm giddy, it's late in the day. Uh, Olaf is created, um, essentially, uh, Anna asks Elsa um, for a companion for the two of them, somebody that they can play with to use her powers to essentially create this creature that is a walking, talking snowman. And so they create it, and then they almost forget about it. I like to think of Olaf as the beta test version of what Elsa can do, and she doesn't quite know the full extent of her powers. And then this frozen, this snowman gets left behind as they continue to grow up, and they only come back to realize that he's still around years later. And he's still trapped in that childhood purity, innocence, of what they were as girls. And that's what's so beautiful about him is he connects them to their past when the future was full of optimism and um, the sky was the limit. So is Olaf like you in any way or are you like Olaf in any way? Well, I think we both look at the world with a doe-eyed um, innocence to a certain extent. I mean, I'm much more aware of things that can harm me than he is as, as is evidenced by his infatuation with Summer. Uh, but... You know, in many ways, we share a lot of the same kind of, huh, qualities. Um, how does the music complement the story in Frozen? The music, uh, as written by Bobby Lopez and Kristen, his, uh, Bobby's wife, is so powerful in that it's not just there to kind of underscore, as is often the case, but it's there to emotionally take us on this journey. Um, and it's been a while since we've seen a movie that does that, especially an original, you know, one with musical elements. To me, there's nothing more powerful than Let It Go, which I think holds its own in the canon of Disney songs as one of those, you know, that will forever be revisited, whether it's part of your world or whether it's When You Wish Upon a Star. Let It Go has all of the elements that make for a classic Disney song. So to have that kind of quality in our movie, I think is doubly exciting because in a way, it's unique in today's animation. You don't get to see um, stories told like that anymore. And especially to the level at which the songs are done. Now, as far as I go, I'm, I'm very preferential to In Summer, my big number. Uh, I grew up watching uh, Aladdin, and I remember sitting in the theater and watching Robin Williams belt out um, his big number, You Ain't Never Had a Friend Like Me. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to do that one day. I really, that is like my big dream. Robin had two major songs from what I remember. I only get one, so I'm a little angry at, at, um, at Bobby and Kristen. But I feel like we got a really great one, so I'm proud of it. It it's a, it's a, it steals the scene every single time. Oh, thank yeah. you. No, well, you'll see when you see it with an audience, you'll see for yourself. I'm very it, excited. It, it it really does. Um, uh, how, how big of a role does the importance of family play in the film, and and is that something that you relate to personally? It absolutely is something that I relate to. I'm a father and about to be a father twice over, and I feel like and I happen to be having two daughters, and so for me that this movie couldn't speak more to that experience. Um, and what I love is, you talk about the idea of family, but 
it's really the idea of siblings and how strong that bond is. And as somebody who grew up with two brothers, you know, I think I would melt for them. Like, I think that I would take that sacrifice where th that bond is what connects you when you're at rock bottom, when you're at your happiest and you need somebody to share it with. You share the same DNA, but not just in the scientific sense, but in the sense of your, your past, your history. Nobody knows you better. Nobody knows your weaknesses and your strengths better than them, even when they take advantage of those weaknesses and beat up on you. Um, they're calling the film an epic comedy adventure, and I think you've touched on this somewhat, but can you speak to what makes the movie funny? Well, I certainly think that what makes the movie funny is this, this sense of adventure that happens in, in the movie when these characters go out and try to save the kingdom harkens back to those like Crosby, you know, uh, those Bing Crosby movies. Or even I remember watching the movie in a screening recently and I said to myself, it even has elements of Star Wars where you've got like Chewie as the reindeer, you know, you've got Han who is um, Hans, you've got um, my character who almost functions as like C-3PO, and you've got this great camaraderie between these characters. I also think that the the characteristics and the, the actors that they've chosen to portray these characters have brought such a interesting nuance to, you know, uh, let me speak to Kristen Bell's character of Anna. It's a, it's a princess unlike any other I've ever seen before. Warts and all, she's a neurotic bumbling mess. And I love that. I love that I've never seen that character before. I've never seen that kind of you know, bubbly little character um, that I think is so unique and fresh. And Elsa is her own kind of breed of um, this powerful woman who, you know, is trying to control what she's capable of. But again, it's, it's done in a way that I think is refreshing and very different. Um, I grew up during the second golden age of Disney animation where it was... Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and Lion King. And having just seen this film and tying it into kind of the legacy that's being created with Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph and now this, you almost feel like we're starting to see maybe the third golden age of Disney animation. And it's very exciting. And I think that the reason that people are reacting so positively to this is that we're telling stories that are as old as time but they're being told with a very unique approach to them that's almost very modern, and it has a, a very um, of the now sensibility to it. Right, that's very true. Um, if, last question, uh, what's it like working with uh, Chris, directors Chris Buck and Jennifer Lee? Working with Chris and Jennifer is the greatest collaboration. It, it speaks to the greatest collaborations in that it's all about teamwork, it's all about it's all about allowing the actor to play and to improv and to find those moments. And it's never a dictatorial kind of element where it's do it this way, this is the only way to do it. And they'll call you out when they're like, okay, that's not working, we need this. But they'll also allow you to find it. And, and the process of creating Olaf was really the three of us sitting down and beating out different versions of what this guy should sound like until we hit on what it became, which is this pure innocence. Innocence at its purest in that it resembled what the girls came from. And I think that they are so gifted, um, especially in their approach to working with actors, that it's such a joy to, um, to sit in the sound booth and, and do your stuff with them.